Yeah. And then they just like walk around and literally like, we're supposed to be like terrified. And I just want to laugh half the time. So it was like a real challenge to not. I think they actually put a face on it to try and make it more intimidating. And that actually made it funnier running around with a pineapple on a stick. So I mean, that was probably the most challenging part was not laughing at a pineapple. All right. Well, absolutely love this film. I'm so glad that it is finally getting its theatrical release. Um, What are you almost excited about? Because I know that you waited since what, like 2020 for this to officially come out? Well, we didn't wait. We waited for, I don't want to jump on this. We were wait, actually waiting for COVID to go away. Um, and then thank you, Tom Cruise, for making it go, making the rest of the world not afraid to go to the theaters again. No, but seriously, Rachel, we, yeah, that is right. We filmed this in 2020. And the amount of time that's passed, like it still feels like a dream. The fact that we actually finished this movie, but everybody always asking, when's it coming out? When's it coming out? And I was like, I, I mean, I don't know. I, I can't wait for people to finally get to see it because the fact that we managed to do this with what we were up against, Kurt, Kate, you guys can speak to this. Like it's surreal to me. And I'm so proud of what we did and how everybody stayed safe. And we managed to create this, you know, and, and it's going to finally be seen by people and it's inventive and fresh and new it's just something that's classic and old school like Stephen King so you know it's it is very exciting I am just most excited to see all the work that we put into this it's oh it's actually crazy we spent three months just non-stop work and we put all of ourselves into this movie we put so much time so much effort and I feel like it's finally paying off which I'm so excited to see Okay, so awesome. not even yeah. but like, I think Lucas told us 350 hours of film at the end of the day. When we finished this thing, 350 hours of film. It's like so. a, a million, a million feet that we shot. And you know, uh, also it's worth in addition to that, both Kate and Elena had to isolate for two weeks, quarantine in a hotel room with their their um uh with their um squires. So there was a lot of sacrifice going on because we we were at one point. As at the beginning, we were the only film shooting in the world. Really? Were you the, the only one in the whole world? That's amazing. The only film. We started shooting in April 2020. We were the only, someone I walked in, my EP walked in and said, you realize you're the only uh, film, you know, the director working on Earth? I thought, well, that's interesting. That's interesting. So COVID, you know, had played a lot of factors in this movie. It obviously delayed the release, but it also helped us in making the movie because it brought us much closer together. I'm so excited that it's finally happening and that everybody is going to get to see it. Um, was this, the short story is set in Nebraska, but where did you guys actually film this? Were you at an actual corn maze? No, no, it's Australia. We, we, we shot it in New South Wales. Um, and that was because that's, it was, you know, it was winter otherwise at that time in, in, a, in Northern America and there's no corn there. So we went to Australia and we grew corn. Um, in um at that time so yeah we, we had a corn maze but we made it we built it we grew it we're all corn farmers i will i was gonna ask did anybody ever get lost in this corn maze but i don't know how big the one you actually grew was so i don't know if we got lost in it more like we got attacked by it because that was like it had its own personality the amount of scratches that we had at the end of every day from that corn like oh my gosh so it definitely yeah it was its own character and i it think was we should about- play the yeah, it was about 50 acres. And I remember we did get a lot when we had to move from one location to another and we were just tromping through the corn to try and find it when we were having two locations, particularly at the beginning of our shoot. Um, you definitely didn't know where you were going. Trekking. Well, <laughs> I was going to say, yeah, like I wonder if the crew all has to split up. Like, does everybody need to stay together and get through? But yeah, awesome. Um, well, hey, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Eden. Um you know, how much were you were, how much were you actually told about her before the film started? Like, did you know anything about her time at the children's home? I actually did. So um, when I was working with Kurt, um, before we actually started filming, like the two weeks and even before that, um, Elena, Kurt and I, we had Zoom calls, like actually being our characters. And we went through scenes um, together to try and get a feel for what our characters were going to be like. Kurt um, recommended I read Lord of the Flies because it kind of has some of the same messages of Children of the Corn, which also really helped. Um, I did learn a bit about Eden's past and I was told to write a diary as Eden, which also helped me get in her headspace. But yeah. That's awesome. Well, then on that same note, Elena, I wanted to ask you a little bit about Bo. You know, personally, what 
so important to her to save this cornfield? Do you think it represented something for her personally or, you know, what were your thoughts on that? Well, the corn, yeah, the corn is, as I said, it's its own character. And to Bo, it's like family. I mean, it's so ingrained in the fabric of the community. Uh, to me, like the dying corn, you know, is withering away is like seeing a loved one die. So for her, yes, she she's on this, she's right, you know, on the precipice of becoming a woman and becoming a scientist and going off to Boston. But the fact that she's got to leave her brother behind and leave behind a decaying town, you know, with all the dysfunction that's going on, it really, it tugs at her. And she means well, Bo. But, you know, she uh, her trying to prevent certain things kind of causes a domino effect. Um, things get a little, you know, crazy. Um, but she means so well. She's feisty. She's whip smart. She's all these things. But um, ultimately, it's the loyalty and ownership she feels towards the corn that, you know, keeps her going back to it. Well, um, Kurt, he who walks among the rows was not shown in the original film. But, you know, the entity is going to be seen in this one. Did that turn out on screen how you had initially imagined it? Well, I don't think it, we uh, anybody imagined. I don't think there's quite a right answer to how that he who walks behind the rose looks. But this was our our version of it. And I think it's a valid version of it. There's a lot of conversation that went into it. It's like, who is this? Is it real? Is he real? Is he a hallucination? As I said, it's a manifestation of this trauma that the, these kids have suffered. And if he is real, you know, what does he look just like a corn cob? You know, what is what does he look like? And, and, you know, so we had a lot of debate about can we anthropomorphize this character, you know, which we ultimately did to a certain extent, because it would look weird if it was just like a giant piece of corn on the cob that was walking around. Um, so, you, you know, so it was it was this finding this balance between something that we really thought was, was that came that grew out of corn that was really made of corn but also was close enough to what people are familiar with when they when they think of things that are creatures and quote unquote creature feature movies. There was a lot of conversation that went into it. Kate and Elena, I wanted to ask you because, uh, well, I assume you're not really seeing he who walks among the corn while you are out there. <laughs> I'm what so glad you like? brought this up. <laughs> yeah, yeah, what is that like? You said corn on the cob, Kurt. We were literally the whole time. The stick with you, yeah, pineapple or a tennis ball. And they just, they, they ran with it. it. Yeah. And then they just like walk around and literally like, we're supposed to be like terrified. And I just want to laugh half the time. So it was like a real challenge to not break. I think they actually put a face on it to try and make it more intimidating. And that actually made it funnier running around with a pineapple on a stick. So yeah. I mean, that was probably the most challenging part was not laughing at a pineapple. And the challenging, and for me, it was like, is this really going to work? Because you know, you're you're there and Elena is on her back and it's two in the morning In she's in the cornfield and it's freezing cold and it's wet and she's moist. I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe if I could do this to her again. And they're like, okay, here's the black ball, the black, black styrofoam ball, scream. There's bugs falling on your face. Come on, he's coming for you, you know? And like, I'm like in my head, I'm saying, I have to pretend like this is going to work, but I have no confidence that it will. Well then, yeah. What is it like watching it back and seeing this added in? I'm glad there's there's something that's not just a, a, a black spray paint. <laughs> yeah. <picture. Wow. laughs> I can say that. But what did you think, Rachel? I honestly, when I saw He Who Walks, I was really impressed. Like I, because I love horror, and the monsters to me are super important when it comes. Like you know, so when I saw him, I was like, oh my gosh! And you know, Digital Domain, who made the who did the special effects, I was like, mm, job well done. I thought he was terrifying, but I'm curious what you thought. Oh, no, I was absolutely terrified. I would not want to be in a corn maze with him, for sure. It was not what I was expecting at all. I don't know what I was expecting, but um, yeah, no, definitely terrifying. Yeah. Well, Kurt, you know, was there anything that you felt really worked or didn't work in the very first film in the original? You know, was there something particular that you found to be terrifying that you really wanted to bring out in this one, like a concept or anything like that? No, I think it's a, the opposite. I, I thought, you know, while I appreciate the first film, I thought it left a lot um, to be said, which is to say that I, I I thought the film, and I'm not talking about the, the book, which the short story, which influenced me more than this, the movie, but, you know, um, I, I, I feel like making children the villains and adults the victims is kind of has everything backwards. Like I just, 
can't relate to that. I think the children are the victims every time, every time they get the benefit of the doubt. And the adults are the evil ones. And But weirdly, the first movie was those evil children and, and, and poor, innocent adults or something like that. And so I thought to me, it just felt um, more natural to, to look at it through the lens of the children. And so that hadn't been done. And I thought, well, if we're going to tell the story about children um, rising up and taking control of their own destiny when adults are screwing everything up, tell it through the eyes of the children. And that's what we did. Well, did any of you guys get a chance to collaborate with Stephen King at all? Was he involved in this process? No, we didn't get to talk to him. We have not yet spoken to him about this. So we'll see what he thinks. Do you each have something that you find the scariest about his work? Is there another work that you would like to be a part of someday that really stands out to you? I'll say one thing before the, before the ladies speak, which is, you know, um, in some senses, this isn't even a horror film. I mean, everybody says Stephen King is the master of King of Horror, and he is. But but also you look at Green Mile and Shawshank Redemption and, you know, um, all the many, many other movies, and they're not horror at all. And, you know, to me, horror is kind of vampires and werewolves and things like this. This to me is much more of a, quite a sort of very violent political drama about kids who rise up and take control of their destiny. So, you know, it, it's, it's, and Stephen King does a lot of interesting stuff and it's not all horror. So, I, and I find the things that he does that are not horror, and this originally in his original short story, it wasn't really horror at all. You know, it was about kids who are religious fanatics who feel like their parents are corrupt and they take over them. That's not really horror. And so um, that's a sort of elliptical answer to your question. That he has a lot of stuff I'd be interested in, but probably not the horror specifically. I just thought The Shining was horrifying. Like, I thought that was all right, you know. <laughs> but um, I agree with what Kurt said, though. That's a very good point. It's not all just horror. There's many different layers to that onion. So all very fascinating. I don't know how to follow that. Um, I don't particularly like horror movies, so, you know, it's a fun time, but I feel like all of his stories have had an impact on people in some way. And I feel like this story kind of has that sort of feeling. So I feel like, you know, it'd be good to just help or try and impact people's lives in a positive way. Well, um, to wrap up, Elena, I wanted to ask you, because I know that, my Big Fat Greek Wedding 3 is coming out this year. How was working on that project? Oh my God. We, yeah, we finished that in summer. We were all over Athens and Gerkira, and it is it was magical, Rachel, because everybody comes back. There's new romance. There's new plot lines and twists. And it also pays uh, Michael Constantine, our, our beloved Papu, and his legacy. So it, it's I, I can't wait for people to see it. September. Oh my gosh. Ooh, and we did it all over the ah. Also, yeah. And then Kate, you have Out of My Mind in post-production. Is there anything you can say about that? I don't even know what to say about that. I think it's a really important movie and I think it's going to impact the way that filmmaking is done, possibly. I feel like everybody on that cast was amazing. It's a really good, it's just a feel good movie to watch, especially if you read the book. I think it stays pretty true to that. I know when I like heard that it was out of my mind, I was like, oh, I read that in grade five and I really wanted to be able to be a part of that. So I'm very excited for that to come out. Aren't you still in grade five? <laughs> I'm in grade oh. nine. <laughs> Well, lastly, Kurt, I just, I know you have a, I think you have a couple different projects in the pipeline. Is there anything that you're really excited about? Well, we have Beekeeper um, by David, with David Ayer is finishing it right now. We finished shooting in um, at Thanksgiving and he's putting it together now. And that's coming out sometime this year. So I'm really, very excited about that movie. All right. Well, that was all I have for you guys. Thank you so much for chatting with me. Thanks, Rachel. But wait, wait, wait. Can you give us a TV recommendation? Because I hear you're a TV fanatic. So I. Oh, my goodness. I, I am a TV <laughs> fanatic. <laughs> like any recommendation? Yeah. Give us what, what should we be watching? What should we be watching before we depart? Are, are you, if, if you guys aren't watching Avid Elementary, that's a good one. That's my shout out. <laughs> Got it. <laughs> All right. Elementary. Cool. Thank you, guys. Thanks, Thank Rachel. You.